last 24 seconds before the official beginning of the drum session, we can demonstrate that we have the very locally appropriate noise maker to make sure that the uh, speakers stay on, on time. Can we have a demonstration? A real We also welcome the audience to help us with clapping to make sure that the speakers stay on time. Now, is it time? It is time. Okay, so welcome to the FSE 2013 RUM session. For those of you who have computers, you can see on fse.2013.rump.cr.yp.to the schedule. For those of you who don't or just want to pay attention, there's an on deck. If you're listed as on deck, you are the next person to talk. And so make sure to come up to the stage so you can quickly jump in and give yourselves. Without further ado, the first speaker will be Bart Neal, who among his many other jobs is also the president of the International Association for Cryptological Research, and he's going to tell us about the ICF. Thank you. Anybody hear me? <coughs> Better? Good. So by the way, I'm not even sure that Dan has a driver's license, so he probably doesn't even have a valid. <laughs> it's something to figure out over a beer tonight. Okay. So my name is Bart Fumil. I'm president of the ICR. The ICR stands for International Association for Cryptologic Research. It's a non-profit organization registered in the US with a goal to advance theory and practice in cryptology. And ICR is run by a board of elected directors and officers, and we are all volunteers, so nobody of us is paid for their time or efforts, and in most cases also we come to the conference and do the events all at our own expenses or the expenses of our employers. So it's a democracy, so there is every year elections. And in addition to elected board members, there are also several representatives and appointed board members, representatives in particular of the Asian Cape PKC, FSE, Chess, and TCC Steering Committee, and I also have the pleasure to serve as FSE representative. So I'm representing you also in the board of ICI. To deliver three flagship conferences, you're probably well familiar with them, four workshops, the Journal of Cryptology, and the newsletter. The reading room at Springer Verlag, we'll come back to this. Uh, we have an archive of past proceedings. We also have the well-known ePrint archive and the Fellows program. So I will not go into all of this in detail. I'll just give you the executive version. If you want the long version of this presentation, I would say come to Europe Crypto, Asia Crypt, and attend the ICR membership meeting. I only get 15 minutes here, so it's not enough to bring you to all those things. So here you see the board. So we have four officers. Christian Kashari is serving as vice president. Um, Martin Stam as secretary and Greg Rose as treasurer. And nine elected directors. And Michel Abdallah, Tom Burson, Amal, Nisanskaya are the newly elected directors for 2013 for two years. Although Tom is already serving on the board since uh, the early 80s. So you also have appointees. I will not go through the list, but you can look at uh, the names. Uh, <coughs> The changes are that we appointed, of course, the general chairs of Eurocrypt, of Crypto and Asia Crypt of next year. And also we have a new representative of the Asia Crypt Steering Committee, Sam Ling, uh, is taking over the job from Stomo Matsumoto. So membership, so by attending FSE, uh, unless you've done special efforts to cross boxes which we make difficult to find, you become actually a member of the ICR, not for 2013, but for 2014. And so if you attended an ICR event in 2012, you became a member in 2013. And this is quite complex, but it's hard to change because our election rules and some other things. So we keep it like this. If you would still like to become a member of ICR in 2013, you can just go to the website and pay by credit card the fee, which is $88 for regular members and $44 for students. So as you see, our membership is about 1,600, and we have close to 400 students. So, FSE is run by the steering committee. It seems that you don't get the full slide, but I guess I'll help you decipher it. It's a challenge for it this afternoon. So, FSE is quite an 
old workshop. In fact, I'm one of the co-founders um, in 1993. Um, and in mid years I'm actually steering committee. And also in, I think, 1999 or 2000, FSE became an ICI-sponsored workshop. It essentially means that the financial risk for FSE is taken by the ICI. And more or less, FSE also follows guidelines issued by the ICI. The steering committee um, it used to be at first a permanent committee, but now we have people with three-year terms. And so this is the current composition of the steering committee. Um, and so Vincent Reitman uh, acts as chair, and he sent me all your regards and his apologies. He couldn't make it here because of his busy teaching schedule um, in the second semester. The last name is Matt Rocha, who moved to the US. <laughs> So, at this moment, I would like to express my thanks to the organizer of this event. So, the ICR and the FSC Steering Committee is very pleased that we have volunteers who do all the hard work. So, first, of course, we have organization of such a conference. If you've ever done this, you will know it's quite hard work. Um, for our long-term preparations, I'm quite sure that Thomas has been discussing here and you have a lot with the hotel here. You have to visit other hotels. It's a whole long process. In particular, it gets more tight in the last months, and especially in the last weeks, and the stress increases. And then, of course, in the end, as you can see, everything goes well because they've done an excellent job. I also know they have a great team behind them, but in the end, responsibility rests with those two people. And so I would like to thank this opportunity, take the opportunity to thank Jan Goa and Thomas Perrin for their efforts as general co-chair of FSC for making it a great event. So Thomas, I think you can start walking already, so you'll be here all time to get your plaque. <laughs> Both are here. So the plaques read the ICR, great for the acknowledges Thomas Parrain and Jean Goua for his contribution to the worldwide conclusion community, for his role as general co chair of FSC 2013. Congratulations, and again, thank you very much for all your efforts. Really appreciate it. for great banquets and great lunches. We actually also come for a scientific program, and this program is selected by the program committee. And the hardest work there is being program chair. The program chair has to put together this committee, and then has to kind of herd the cats, try to get the reviews in on time, try to get the decisions. And then in the end, also here, has to make sure that every session and everything is smoothly organized. And so I think we can all agree that she did an excellent job. And so for this reason, also the ICR and the FC Steering Committee want to thank her. So the flag reads the ICR gratefully acknowledges Shiho Moriai for her contribution to the worldwide ecology community through her role as program chair of FSE 2013. Thank you very much. So time is running quickly. I will get more details on this later. So. FSC 2014 uh, will be in London, in the UK. This is still tentative because there has been no vote yet in the ICR board because the ICR takes financial liability and looks at the proposal. This has not happened yet. The proposal was just approved. But you can expect official approval in the coming week, say by the beginning of April. Uh, this is an official announcement, but at least this is what's being uh, decided by the steering committee. And so Christian will give you an update at the end of the passage. So, who has heard of the ICR reading room? Who has never heard of this? We've all heard of this. So we can be brief then. Um, there is good news and bad news. The bad news is it will be stopped. The good news is something better will come in place. <laughs> but we're still working on this, so for now, if you want to get access, um, apparently many people in the room know about it, so I can be very quick and not spend too much time on this. So you can go to the ICR website, get a token, then go to Springer, and then you have access to all our great content, which includes um, Job of Cryptology, all the past FSEs, cryptos, and whatever. So for the last year, the ICR board has been working very hard on publications because our publication contract was expiring. Publications are very complex, and I don't have time to go into all the elements, but there is, of course, this <coughs> is an archival. 
There is a scientific premise element about having a formal publisher. Most of us have bosses who want us to publish in serious venues and not on pieces of paper or just on the website. Um, there is also some organizations that care a lot about impact factors, indexing, and citations. If you don't know what those things are, you're a very lucky person. Um, if you do, then I guess you know it's a very important and you cannot just put papers on the web page when you may actually not be evaluated correctly by some, um, let's say, bean counters. And something else, of course, is you want a single source. And so there is also many um, positions or point of views. You have ICR authors, you have ICR members, and then you have the broader community. I mean, generally, you want to try to make if, as much information as possible available to the broader community without damaging the ICR authors. It's more or less the thing we have to balance because we believe that broad dissemination is also for the benefit of the authors. On the other hand, we could just put things on our web page, but then they probably would not get traffic in citations and some other things if there's no formal publisher. So this is more or less the tension we have to deal with. So the good news is that um, a few months ago, uh, we signed a new contract with Springer for four years. Okay. And here are the changes. This is important for authors, but also for readers. So I'll have three perspectives first for authors. There will be official versions of your paper, and we'll have these official footnotes for them. One is the Springer version, which is the version which is as today available in the Springer library. But access to Springer will go to a login at the ICR site. It will be the difference. So you log in at ICR, then you get access to Springer. We hope to put this in place in the next few months. Then there will be the ICR version, which is the version which you submit to the proceedings. And in fact, afterwards, you can change it so it looks more like a Springer version. What you cannot change is the footnote, which is specific, different between the Springer version and the ICR version. Okay. You will also now be encouraged to upload your paper immediately to ePrint. If you don't do it, we'll do it for you. <laughs> but we, will, we prefer you do it for technical reasons. Because Springer doesn't want that all the FSC papers have the same consecutive numbers on ePrint. So you should randomize this a bit, but this is more <laughs> like <laughs> who is faster? That's the game. Who is faster on ePrint? That's the game. Okay? This is going to introduce a new competition, FSC paper with the lowest ePrint number of that year. Okay? So, Copyright form will allow we use for the thesis and pictures. Um, then if you have later revisions, there will also be a footnote which you have to use. To either say this is still copyright ICR or if it's more than 25%, you can say this is based on or this is an evolution of. And of course, ICR has no copyright on major revisions. Okay, these footnotes will be in the new copyright statement. It should be on the website by the end of the month. So as members and conference attendees, you'll have access to all ICR content on Springer. Okay, so you actually, you, for FSC, this is automatic. This always, also will be the case for, well, FSC is on the website of the conference. But for all the other conferences, it will be at the conference website or on Springer's website. Okay, we can freely distribute the print PDF. The print PDF is the whole book as one PDF. We cannot distribute the individual papers. So you have to cut it yourself or hire somebody to do this for you. Um, or get them one by one at Springer's site. Okay. Don't ask me why, but those details are for Springer very important. I mean, they're completely irrelevant, but we discussed weeks and weeks about this. Okay? So, then the access. So, Springer, um, so in fact, if you want the paper, you go to ePrint. All of our papers from 2013 will be on ePrint. That's where you can find them, all the versions. So, ePrint will now support more versions of a paper, um, or in a more visible way. In the ICR archive, you'll get all papers from 2000 onwards, which are older than two years. So the ICR archive will always be two years behind. Okay. And then finally, the Springer website, um, all ICR papers older than four years will become public for everybody in the whole world. Plus, they will open up their whole past. So in fact, in the next weeks or months, all the old ICR papers, which are at least four years old, will be openly available to anybody on the Springer website. Okay. If we stop the contract in four years, they will lock every old content back up. So please download, download, download. <laughs> but the new content, they will never look up again. So it's a one-way function. If everything published after 2013, even if you break the contract, it will never go back behind their box. It's not perfect, but I think we are way better than we were, say, 10 years ago or five years ago. Um, and so it requires some efforts from you and from the ICR, so it will take about six months to implement all these in our IT systems. But you also will have to do some effort to take into account our new rules. Okay, if you have questions, come and see me. I'm not allowed to put the contract online, but I can tell you everything which is in there. So, publications opt-in for paper, 
proceedings already currently opt in, so you will not get a book anymore unless you pay extra for it. Trump cryptology, I want to encourage you to opt out. So please go to the ICR website. If you don't want those <coughs> pieces of dead wood, go there and save the ICR money. Okay? In the end, you can use this to reduce the membership fee. Okay? So this is my one but last slide, so I think I will not get the noise to stop me. So flagship conferences, there is an encouragement to program chairs to accept more papers. So, and if you serve on the committee, um, you should be aware of this. Um, and I think you will also see this. I think Europe, crypto, Asia crypto are closer to 30, 30 something. I think they now more 40, 40 something. And there is some encouragement to go further. Okay. We're also working on a discussion forum on ICL.org. There is new ethical guidelines for authors and reviewers in case you wonder what your rights and duties are. And sometimes there are problems. People actually violate these rules. And for this reason, we've written them down. So if you have doubts, you can actually go there. You can send your students there, and they can look at what we expect from authors and reviewers. And as you see here, everything is being recorded, but of course, only with presenter's privilege. And so the new copyright form will also um, require a license, probably, to distribute the slides and the video. And you'll be able to, of course, refuse this. Okay. So if you have further questions about ICR, just ask me. I have just one announcement only for local people. Okay. So I'll come back to Singapore in two and a half weeks. I'll be performing with my band on the Esplanada, <laughs> Thursday, 4 April, April at 8 p.m. So you're all warmly invited to come back to Singapore. <laughs> Thank you. So, one request for the speaker, whenever you're done, advance the slide till past your slide. So we have a chance of seeing who's the next speaker and who's going to be on that deck next. Now the next talk is no surprise, it's the program chair of FSE, and the topic is Statistics and Best Paper Award. Okay, I talk about uh, FSA 2000. Uh, to, uh, okay, I talk about the FSA 2 uh, Darian study and as a statistics. And uh, best, uh, we will have later. We will have a best paper award ceremony. Okay, uh, we have we received uh, 19 uh, seven submissions from 20, uh, 24 countries. Now we received uh, the largest number of submissions from China, and uh, <laughs> the top five uh, submission numbers, uh, uh, top five um, submission number uh, countries are uh, China, uh, France, Japan, Singapore, and Korea. And regarding the, accept the number of accepted papers, uh, top, top three countries are uh, France, and Belgium and UK. And uh, this is uh, this graph shows uh, statistics by country, the number of authors in submitted papers. Uh, the top five countries are China, France, Korea, Japan, and Germany. And I think Asian power is becoming big. And this graph shows the number of submissions. We uh, opened the submission server on October 8th. And the deadline was uh, November uh, 12th. And that's a timing of one week before the, one week before the deadline. We only have, um, only, uh, we received less than 10 submissions. And that's a um, timing of 14 hours before the deadline, we had only uh, 43 submissions. I was so uh, impatient. <laughs> but as a, uh, during the last 14 hours, uh, the number of submissions doubled. And finally, we received 100 uh, submissions. Thank you very much for your contributions. <laughs> And I'd like to talk about the time difference program. Our submission deadline was November uh, 12th, uh, 
five o'clock in the afternoon in Japan Standard Time GST. By the way, uh, Japan Standard Standard Time is generated and disseminated by NICT, my organization. <laughs> and this is the email uh, box at that time. On oh, my <laughs> email box. Uh, during the deadline time, I suffered a DOS attack from the submission server. <laughs> and I received never ending emails notifying resubmission, resubmission, resubmission. And, um, and even after uh, 5 o'clock, I received uh, many, many resubmission emails. And I waited half an hour uh, until the email stopped and the closed that server. But I received that other kinds of emails after that. For example, oh, sorry. For example, I am from China. Uh, when I served the submission <coughs> system Easy Chair this afternoon, um, unfortunately the submission system has been closed because the uh, submission uh, deadline has passed. Previously, I thought that the submission deadline was Beijing time. I did not notice the time difference problem. Wow! I received another email saying, uh, another email saying, I just found out that we couldn't upload the late, uh, last version of our paper and that the website closed. I apparently missed one hour in my time conversion. I received another email saying that uh, I was expecting the FSC submission still open for this hour and was surprised to find it already closed. And uh, soon after, I received another email saying, I realized now that time zone in Japan and Singapore are one, one hour apart. That's my computer. And I received uh, while updating the submission access in the last minute. The server was closed. We would greatly appreciate uh, if you can read blah, blah, blah. So please be careful of time difference. Paper reviewing. Uh, the paper review was done by uh, 21 PC members and more than 90 external reviewers. Thank you very much. And in total, um, we, uh, they delivered 337 reviews and uh, each submission uh, was reviewed at least uh, three uh, program committee members and uh, submission by program committee members received at least five reviews and in total uh, we accepted uh, 31 papers among 97 submissions the acceptance rate was 32 percent and here uh, two papers were merged into one, and the four papers were improved uh, in the process of jeopardy. So I'd like to talk about the best papers. Uh, ja the Journal of Cryptology is now soliciting, soliciting a few good papers uh, from the top uh, crypto cryptographic uh, conferences. And we the uh, program committee of FSC uh, selected two papers uh, for general cryptology solicitation. One paper is on weak keys and forgery attacks against polynomial based max schemes by Gordon Proctor and Carlos Seed. And the other paper is Reflection Gift Analysis of Prince Like Cyphers by Hadi Sleimani and uh, Salim Blond. Uh, Shall we you? Uh, Wendling Wu, Kaiser Newberg, Huibin Zhang, Dei Zhang, and Yangfen, uh, Yangfen Wang. Congratulations! <laughs> and I'd like to move on to the uh, FSC uh, 2013 Best People Award Ceremony. Uh, the Best paper is go uh, goes to uh, on weak uh, keys and forgery attacks against polynomial based max schemes by Gordon Proctor and Carol Seed. Uh, Gordon, where is Gordon? Ah, would you come up on the stage? This 
newspaper abroad, the program committee of first software encryption 2013 is glad to present the best paper award of the conference to Gordon Proctor and Carlos Seed uh, for their contribution titled on weak keys and forgery attacks against polynomial-based math schemes. All right, thank you. So the next Sasaki-san will tell us about fault analysis with coupon collector's problem. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yu Sasaki, and this is joint work with, uh, with uh, Yan and uh, Hikaru and Kazuo, uh, the hardware guys from the University of Electrocommunications. Okay, uh, so I'd like to combine side channel analysis with coupon corrector's program. So first I'd like to introduce what the coupon corrector's program, but I hope it's well known. But anyway, so there are several coupons inside the box. For each coupon drawing event, one random coupon is obtained. And after, after the event, you will return the coupon in the box again. So one simple question is, how many events are expected to complete all the coupons? <laughs> so this is called coupon for the correct test program. And uh, it is well known that the, the expected value is n log m. And uh, this problem can be applied to the false attack. So what is the motivation? Why we apply coupon correct test program to false attack? The motivation is because it is fun. But uh, as, a, as a byproduct, the assumption for the fault injection can be more real, realistic. So when you inject the fault, the noise may occur, and but uh, we can still recover the key even with the noise. Okay, so I'd like to introduce the yes, but I think everyone knows. So uh, just two nodes, uh, add the key and the mix ground, that's what here, and I i uh, give the detailed description of the drug key in the last round. Okay, so this is a concept of the square differential fault analysis proposed by Pan and Ian and uh, to, uh, to say in 2006. So, okay, so the same print text is encrypted again and again to 56 times. Therefore, each time, uh, the, the attacker tries to inject the fault at the beginning of the same round at one byte. So he wants to collect all values at one byte. So that denoted by A, and the other values are constant. Now I think everyone knows the integral property. So, so this old property will be preserved at the uh, last state of the round nine. Okay, then how to recover the key? So the last round is described here. The attacker gets the last round uh, sub key K10 from byte lab. Okay, so guess that four bytes and decrypt all the 256 texts up to here. And because all bytes take all the distinct values, so you can recognize the correct key. So the probability is that the random choice, um, the random and the wrong key will satisfy this property is described by this equation, which is really zero, cross zero. So the correct key is recover. So this is the previous idea. And actually, uh, the Kim proposed an improvement of the square DFA. So he showed that 256 values are not necessary. So collecting only alpha is, is, is enough. And yeah, for if you guess the key, uh, if the guess is correct, then you will observe alpha distinct values at uh, this state, and uh, the probability is not so big. Actually, the king shows that the probability is smaller than two to the minus thirty-two for alpha equal forty-five. That means the key is reduced to one. Okay. The previous two ideas. 
assumes that unintended fault never occurs. But in practice, the noise is obtained. So this is the intended uh, for the white positions, but it may be in, injected in a different white position, or it may affect several white positions. But still, we can recover the key. So that's the idea. This is the idea. So we have two parameters. One is alpha, so the number of this fold values, and the other is n, so the total number of the text to be analyzed. So you have correct alpha text and noise n minus alpha text, so in total n text. And for the correct guess, uh, you will observe at least alpha density values due to the correct text. And what's the probability of this event? Now actually, this is equivalent to the coupon collector's problem. <laughs> so suppose alpha is 256. So now there are 256 coupons. For, for, each, uh, for each guess, you will apply the partial decryption, and uh, it will take some value from 256 possibilities. So this is draw one coupon. And uh, you will repeat this for all uh, texts. So draw a coupon n times. Now, if all coupons are completed, then uh, the guess is right key candidate. Otherwise, the guess is wrong, so you can reduce the key space. And uh, actually, we evaluated uh, in a precious way, and uh, I omitted the details, but uh, we obtained some results. Okay, so this is the conclusion. So we generalized the squared DFS so that the noisy for the injection can be accepted. And we did the probability estimation with the coupon collector's problem. And the people will appear at financial crypto. And we are very welcome for any suggestions, comments, and feedback. Thank you for your attention. OK, next up, Ivan Nurich, who will talk about work with Drew Quintrick, Sam Amir, Sam Lee, or Jung Wang on complementing Clefia and so we try to apply the complementation property, the general complementation property that I talked about yesterday to the block cipher Clefia 128, which is a four-branch generalized Faisal cipher with 128-bit key. It has 18 rounds, and the important thing is the Faisal round. First, it has XOR of the sub-key followed by some random transformation. Meaning, we can apply the general complementation property if we can find a good differential for the key schedule. Now here we are dealing with four branch generalist uh, Faisal cipher, meaning the iterative characteristics has four rounds instead of two. So if we take a look at the key schedule, we have the master key and then in 12 rounds, we produce this intermediate key L. And then the sub keys are just output of this, and then we have some linear transformation with a bit permutation. You XOR the key output. Then again, linear transformation output, you XOR key output, linear transformation output, you XOR, and so on. So basically, as we need alternating differences with four rounds, meaning this output and this output has to be the same, the difference, and then this output and this output and this output and the following output, and so on. So actually we have found that uh, among the 2 to the 128 differences, uh, there are 2 to the 14 differences such that this, after two rounds, becomes this. And then you can find the difference in the key. So you have this, 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 they're all good for the complementation property. So basically, for each of these 2 to the 14 differences in L, we have corresponding 2 to the 14 differences in K, and we can apply the complementation property. The only problem is, of course, that here we have 12 rounds of Feistel meaning that no differential characteristic has any good probability. But we have 2 to the 14 such differences. Another thing that, that we've noticed, that these 2 to the 14 differences actually can be divided into two independent sets, 2 to the 7 and 2 to the 7 differences. So we can, uh, so basically we can iterate through this 2 to the 7 and 2 to the 7, if we take any difference from these two sets, it's a, one of these 2 to the 14 good differences, meaning, we can uh, go with two structures of 2 to the 7 plain text and corresponding keys, and another structure of 2 to the 7 plain text and corresponding keys. Obtain the ciphertext, and then we use another property that we just have to find collisions on these two sets. 
So instead of testing 2 to the 14 pairs, we only have to find collisions between two sets of 2 to the 7 elements, which can be done in 2 to the 7 time. So basically, we just save this factor of 2 to the 7. And as a result, we get a distinguisher for full round clefia. This is only a distinguisher, it's not a key recovery. We exploit the fact that we have 2 to the 14 weak keys. And we can launch the distinguisher with <coughs> to the 122.5 encryptions and similar data complexity. And we can obtain similar results for the FIA 256 as well. So again, it's just based on the general complementation of property and finding a good differential for the key schedule and a few more other tricks we've used. Thank you. All right, remember that when you're done with your talk, you should push the right arrow so that you get to the slide announcing the next speaker and also the speaker after that. We're very happy to have Takashi Kurokawa, who will give us a brief introduction of CryptRec activities in Japan. I'm uh, Takashi Kurokawa, I'm a researcher of NICT, and uh, a member of the Secretariat of CryptoEc. Uh, in Asia Crypto 2000, uh, Professor Imai and uh, Dr. Yamagishi reported about earlier, early activity of CryptoEc. Uh, uh, over 10 years past, I would like to talk about uh, recent activities of CryptoEc. CryptoLeg is the abbreviated name and uh, is a research project in Japan since 2000. Uh, to, uh, aim is CryptoLeg is to con contribute to Could the, you the mic uh, 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 realization of, of the government. Uh, CryptoLeg makes a list of secure cryptographic techniques which are examined closely by a lot of experts, uh, domestic and international cryptographers. And crypto uh, organization is divided into two parts. The advisory, advisory board is run by two ministries, we, we call MIC and METI. <laughs> and several committees and working groups are run by two corporations, NICT and IPA. NICT IPA get uh, budget from two ministries above mentioned. Uh, here is the line plot of meeting count ever had. Uh, irregular, <laughs> it seemed irregular, but there are several good reasons <laughs> like this. And and uh, here is a line plot uh, evaluation report written by X experts. The budget seems to be tighter, tight, <laughs> uh, but uh, the cost of performance becomes better. Here is a old list. And we have just released a new list this March. Uh, the list is divided in three parts, e-government recommended cipher list, candidate recommended cipher list, uh, monitor cipher list. Three standard categories are added. Uh, website in English will be updated soon. Uh, the first list is here. Uh, here is the first list. Newcomer is k cipher 2 and candidate, uh, second list is uh, here, here. Uh, Crepia and uh, Enokoro and PCMAC is a new command. So final, final list is the uh, uh, monitor list. Sorry, in Japanese. <laughs> Finally, uh, uh, we would like to thank all the reviewers who have uh, made a list. Thank you very much.
speaker is Nathan Meng. The next speaker is. Uh, please get ready when you're up there. Okay, so the next one is about ASK about the uh, asymmetric security. Hello, everybody. The ASK 2003, uh, uh, the third Asia workshop on symmetric cryptography will take place in Shandong, Weihai, uh, of China. The, the time of the conference is August 27 to 29. Weihai is a coast city of eastern China. It's famous for its seafood. Uh, it's only one hour uh, fly from Beijing to Weihai. The conference place uh, is the International Exchange Center of Shandong University uh, in Weihai. Uh, this workshop is a closed workshop. We limited uh, the participants uh, to 60 persons. The workshop uh, included uh, two parts, the invited, the invited, uh, invited talks and uh, group disca discussions. The subject includes uh, block ciphers, three ciphers, high functions, proofs, implementations. Mm, the workshop is mainly uh, for researchers from Asia, but we also welcome participations outside Asia. The registration of this workshop is uh, completely free. Limit numbers of statements for play tickets may be available for PhD students. Welcome to Captain Earth. Thank you. All right, we were asked uh, actually some month or so ago by Jean-Philippe Bonasson to present some slides on the password hashing competition. So Tanya will be presenting those slides. Jean-Philippe wasn't able to come. Um, actually, it was after that they were, we were asked to run the rump session, but we decided to present the slides anyway. So Tanya. Okay, so here you go on behalf of Jean-Philippe. So there's going to be not only the competition that then announces more of the CISA competition, but there will also be the password hashing competition. Now, we just had a hash competition, so what's the difference? So when you look at the SHA-3 requirements, when you look, well, then you get all the breathing in. Let's turn the volume back up. If you turn the volume back up, then it's much more reasonable. Okay, so the SHA-3 requirements were that the hash should be secure, fast, and better than MD5 and SHA-1, SHA-2, and so on. So the, re the restriction there was it should be a fast hash function. Now if you look at what password hashing needs, then slightly overstating it, it wants to have a secure and slow and better than the 5 sha one sha 2 and some password hashing functions which you know from well, bcrypt, scrypt, and f2. So that's the difference that here it should be slow because, well, you want the attacker who's doing a brute force attack on you to have a lot of, of effort to do so. So if you go to passwordhashing.net, then you find all the details about the password hashing competition. So here you see in way too small font some details about what you submit and why this competition matters, such as, well, it's important to get the poor state of password protection in web services. Passwords are too often stored, I think, clear, and so on. So if you look at latest security breaches, say LinkedIn, all passwords leaked. Then the problem was it was either stored and not encrypted at all, or was just an MD5 thing, which is then easy to, to brute force. So what the competition asks for is the one password hashing for web services, such as LinkedIn. They also would like to have key deprivation for folder encryption, then also pin hashing for mobile phones. Um, if you go on the web page, they have a quite impressive list of lots of people, some of our community, some are more practical people. Um, some are government employees, some are academia, some are industry, who will decide on what is a good portfolio of password hashing schemes. So the engineering challenge is to design something which is costly to evaluate for attackers, 
Sure, you still want to run this on your mobile phone, but you want to stop an attacker with a GPU phone from doing it quickly. Or if you have FPGA, so you want something which is like memory hungry. You want to have a big state in the middle. And if there is no challenge, then if you're rather into proving things, then prove lower bounds on time and space usage and design new modes of operation that match uh, password caching. There are some associated events. So there is a conference in Las Vegas on passwords. So that one of them is the attack one. That's in, in July. And then there's now one in December, uh, more academic, about password caching. So that's it. Thanks. So I'm going to present. Do you hear me? A very recent, uh, some very recent results from last week that uh, Virginie Lallemand and I have found. So uh, the main result is a full cryptanalysis on uh, Claim 64. Uh, Claim is a lightweight block cipher that was presented uh, at uh, RFID SEC in 2011 by uh, Gong, Nikova and Lo. It has a 64-bit uh, state, and it can have uh, a key size of 64, 80, or 96, depending on the version. And depending on the version, the number of rounds performed is 12, 16, or, 12, 16 or 20. So uh, those rounds are formed by four operations. The first operation is, an, uh, is a key addition. This key is added uh, by XOR, and each time we add a different uh, subkey that is generated by key schedule that has an important property that we have exploited in the attacks and that has had been uh, previously pointed out in the analysis paper <coughs> that the lower and the higher levels of the key do not mix while computing the keys. Next, uh, the other operation performed in one round is the sub-levels operation, which means that uh, Four business boxes are applied to the state. That means that there are 16 four business boxes in total. Then we have a rotation of levels, which uh, rotates uh, the state of 16 bits to the left. And in the end, we have uh, a mixed level operation that uh, what it does, it takes uh, 32 bits uh, of the states on one side and 32 bits on the other, and it applies one mixed column to each, to each side. So as you can see, the first uh, the three first operations are level-wise. As we said that the key can completely be separated into parts when we compute it uh, through the key schedule. And the only operation that makes uh, both uh, parts interfere is the mixed level one. And uh, this is the main uh, property that has been already exploited in crypto analysis. So, so far, uh, there was a paper in Inscript 2011 that uh, proposed uh, an attack on seven rounds of the 64 version and on eight rounds of the 80 key bit version. Uh, on Android 2011, we presented uh, an attack that worked uh, for eight rounds of the 64 key version. And uh, recently on ePrint, uh, there's a paper that I think it should be classified in another category, as it is not really an attack, but it's an accelerated exhaustive search of the key. And that uh, it's applied with V clicks on 12 rounds, uh, so on the cipher as uh, an accelerated exhaustive search that it is, and allows to recover the key a bit faster than just doing it uh, two to the 64 times. So uh, our new results per, uh, permit to recover the key on the full claim without needing to uh, perform an exhaustive search on all the bits of it. And we also provide improved results for the other two versions. So how do our attacks work? Uh, first, we had a look at the differential path from end of 2011. And uh, there, first, we have a distinguisher, and then we exploit this distinguisher in order to recover some key bits. Uh, also, we use some neutral bits for uh, the distinguisher to be more efficient. And uh, we had a look at that, and uh, we do not need uh, neutral bits anymore. And we do not even need to find first a distinguisher before performing the attack. So the main idea is going to be that we can push the path, the path farther and we will get the lower levels of the key. As we said before, once we know the lower levels of the key at one uh, step, we can compute the lower bits of, the, of all the keys for all the remaining steps as it's independent. And then for each 
step that we, have, that we want to undo, we have to uh, get some more information bits that are going to be compensated by the conditions of the differential path. And that's way, that way, we can compute many wrongs uh, backward without increasing the number of people that are passing the rounds. So when we arrive at the first round, uh, we have to equalize values and differences, and uh, this means that we'll have enough collision for filtering out. So uh, this is the complexity of this first attack. This is the path uh, when we apply to 11 rounds. I don't have time to go into the details. And uh, we also found out that this is improved, it can be improved if uh, we relax the differential path and we allow to have differences in eight levels in the beginning. So this way we can uh, use structures to reduce uh, a lot the data complexity and uh, also have a negligible memory. So uh, this is the result that we obtained in the three versions. So in claim, we improve four rounds the previous attack. So it works on the full 12 rounds. In claim 80, we can attack 14 rounds, which improves six rounds the previous attack. And we also provide the first results on claim 96, which work on 15 rounds out of the 20. Thank you. Push the right arrow. Okay, next up is going to be iFeed, the input feed authenticated encryption modes, and the presenter will be Li Ting Zhang. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, welcome everyone. I'm Li Ting Zhang from China. Here I introduce our newly designed aging mode iFeed. Our motivation is that uh, we have observed in the current uh, region one, one pass and the block software based uh, aging mode in their decryption process, they all have to um, called uh, make an inverse query to the block surface. So our target is to design such a uh, one pass with one and the block surface bit more so that uh, without calling the inverse query to our block surface. I will basically our method is that we in the design we feed our inputs to block surface <coughs> to load or backward to the output of block surface. So to get the inputs uh, to block surface in decryption, we just uh, uh, use other use other calls to other block surfaces and then we get the current input to block surface. We'll mm -hmm. see clearly later. Uh, we have turned two different modes upward and uh, backward. Similarly, this is the picture for our uh, iPhone. Uh, it's a non based one, so to encrypt a message, we need to announce a message and secure key only <coughs> one key and. Uh, in encryption, we first uh, encrypt the uh, sing, uh, zero block to get a single value u, and then use u and announce we get another single value v, and uh, by u and v, we get long enough secret mask the i, and uh, use this single mask, we mask them to uh, different message blocks, and uh, then put the block suffer. This that uh, the input to this block suffer is forwarded to here. Then we get a subtext. It's an advantage that it's only one pass and a single key, and uh, in encryption it can be done in a parallel way to call, calling the handbook software key. And it also keeps the server test lens, lens, server test lens. I mean that uh, the server test C1, C2, and the CL plus 1, their total length is equal to the length of announce plus the length of all messages. Unfortunately, the current security count we online, that is, we have to the first uh, uh, message block, means we have to know the total length, just, uh, at, just in the beginning. An interesting feature <coughs> in the design is that uh, we give a new method to combine the privacy and the authenticity protection together. That is, uh, the subject has the C1, protect the, protect the privacy for message 1, C2 for M2, and for the author protection, <coughs> the server has C2 protect M1, and similarly. Okay. In, in, in decryption, we, it's clear that we do not need the universe, and unfortunately, we have it in a sequential way. And watch it that in the proof, we do not need the SPRP assumption. But only PRP is enough for to ensure the security after the first bound. And uh, <coughs> general, generally, to use the use a commercial function because we do not uh, need the inverse query. 
We also have another more dancer put in, uh, fit the input backward to the output. It's achieved both online and let's put them together. Unfortunately, in duration, we have to do it in the inverse way. The model is still in adjusting, and uh, I like your comments. Thank you. You can come. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Push the key. <laughs> okay, we have a zero minute slot for Christian Lechberger announcing something about postdoc positions and postdoc uh, PhD positions. And we have a real announcement from Christian Lechberger together with Carlos Sid on the next FSC. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Christian Lechberger. And I would like to talk about FSC 2014 and answer the question that some of you might have asked where do we go next year? So it's going to be London. And I will be, together with Carlos Sitt, uh, organizing it. Um, the subtitle of FSC 2014 could have been Crypto with Dinosaurs, and I would like to explain why. So first of all, it will be the first week of March. The venue will be the National History Museum in London. And uh, Carlos and I will be both general co-chairs and program co-chairs. Um, well, London, it's a very exciting city, and it's extremely easy to reach. It's has five airports, and if you don't want to fly directly, you could even fly to some European country like uh, France or Belgium or the Netherlands and still have very convenient and uh, efficient train connections there, so that's also save some, some costs for sure. Um, the venue, that's where the dinosaurs come into the game. It's going to be the National History Museum. It's uh, the nice uh, central location in London, close to the Hyde Park. And in addition to having our our conference facilities there. During the coffee breaks, we will be able to enjoy skeletons of large animals. How about that? <laughs> we will provide you with a number of good deals with hotels, but for the time being, this is a, um, a Google search that gives you an idea about the, the immediate proximity. Of so far, so good. I hope to see all of you next year in London. Thank you.